I mean, this is something I talk about all the time. It's, it's so, it's so important for women. The fertility thing isn't a joke. We want to have children. It's important. Spending three years with someone who you are not going to have a future with, which does happen, by the way, I know many women who have done this is to me, devastating. Like you want control over your timeline. That is not the way to do it. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narrative about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Abby Roth is the creator of the YouTube channel Classically Abby, where she talks about lifestyle, culture, and commentary from a conservative and classic perspective. Abby has over 95,000 subscribers on YouTube, 60,000 followers on Twitter, and 34,000 followers on Instagram. Abby, who also happens to be conservative commentator Ben Shapiro's sister, began her career as a trained opera singer with three degrees in operatic performance from the University of Southern California and the Manhattan School of Music. She's the first conservative influencer, and on her series, Let's Be Classic, she has interviewed Candace Owens, Liz Wheeler, and Lila B. Rose, to name just a few. Abby is here with me today to talk about feminism, beauty standards, dating in the modern world, and marriage. Welcome to the show, Abby. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so not, I'm just thrilled to be talking to you. And I know we tried to get together in the past. And so finally, it's happening. This is great. So um, I told everybody a little bit about, you know, you know, your background, but tell everybody, just tell everyone who you are, why you do what you do, how you got here, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> So, you know, I'm classically Abby. I, uh, I started this blog about, I guess at this point it would be two and a half years ago. Um, and I initially was an opera singer. So I had gone to school for opera for seven years. And during that time, I had to come to some real realizations about kind of what I wanted to do for my future. And when I met my husband, that became very clear very quickly because being an opera singer, it's just not conducive to having a family. It's really, really hard. I know, I really don't know almost any opera singers who are happily married and who have children and who are successful. Like those three things, you can't have all three. And before you go on, let me just pause there and say, you could plug in a handful of careers, right? For which that is still the case. Yes. And people don't want to talk about that because it's so not PC, but it is so necessary. So keep going. <laughs> so as I, you know, was graduating my last year of, of school, I went to the Aspen Music Festival, which is a huge, one of the top opera festivals in the world. And I got to sing a main role on the main stage. And it was the biggest opportunity I'd ever had. And I had just met my husband. And we immediately spent 10 weeks apart. And I thought to myself, this is the most unhappy I've ever been. And that was a huge realization. Like the opera wasn't going to carry me through being apart from my, my future husband and my family. Like that became immediately clear. So once I had that realization, I was like, okay, what do I want to do? What is important to me? I knew I wanted to do something that was going to make some sort of difference. And I'd had sort of an existential crisis about opera even before this, thinking, okay, is this for me or is this for a bigger purpose? And I realized that what I wanted to talk about was being a conservative woman and creating a community for conservative women that would allow them to have support and allow them to be able to speak and find other women in that community and who had that as a background. And being an opera singer, being in the arts, I was alone. Alone, I was just gonna say. <laughs> my producer was in the music field and she could say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I realized that that was, that to create a community like this would be invaluable to so many women. So I started my, my blog initially being more of like classic. I didn't wanna come out as conservative right off the bat because I wasn't sure how that would go and I knew it would totally block me from having any career in opera. And I wasn't totally set to do that yet. And then a year later, I realized, just as the pandemic was hitting, actually, 
that this was important, that I needed to say that I was conservative. And so I did, I said it. And so now what I would say my brand is, is a place for me to talk about commentary, lifestyle, beauty, fashion, opera, all from a conservative perspective, because that wasn't available to me when I was in college, when I was in my master's program to find women who talked about the things I was interested in online from this conservative and classic perspective. So I love the fact that you use the word classic. Um, here's the thing about the word conservative. You know, it's, it's so butchered. It's just so meaningless sometimes for people today because they, because it's got bad connotations. I mean, liberal does too, but the words have been so butchered that I can't tell you how many times my husband and I will be talking about something and say, it's, it's not even conservative. It's just, it's just common sense. It's just normal. You know, it's like just regular thinking. Exactly. And it's not that he doesn't recognize there's other ways of thinking. It's that th this is not what it's made out to be. It's just like you say, you're using the word classic, right? It's timeless, timeless stuff that rolls with the era, which go, rolls with the decades, I should say, because we're dealing with human nature. We're talking about facets of human nature that don't change no matter how much we do. And so calling it conservative, it's, it's just, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Do you find that? I, I understand what you mean. I haven't come across it too much in my own experience, but I understand where you're coming from. And I think that you're right. And that's part of the reason I liked using the word classic initially before I, I said I was conservative because women who aren't necessarily, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I know a lot of women who call themselves liberal, but who live out the values of conservatism. <laughs> and that to me means that they're yes. classic. Like yes. you are a classic woman. That's what that is. You don't understand because you don't want to be labeled conservative. So why don't you take the label classic? And maybe if you take the label classic, you'll start to realize that the label conservative isn't so bad. <laughs> Agreed. And I understand the other side because I, I assume you probably got into the thing where it's like, it's not specific enough. People don't know what you're standing for if you just said that. Yes. That, yeah. So I absolutely get it. And anyway, yeah, I mean, like immediately if you say conservative influencer, you're separated from the pack, which is very good in, in my opinion. Um, so at the very least, you know, it stands out that way, which is great. Um, okay, so we should also mention that you're Ben Shapiro's sister. I think people, most people who, who know who you are probably know that, but. Um, it's we, actually I'll, funny. I'll, I'll, I will just quickly say, okay. I have a contingent of, it's like my subscribers, I would say are split in half, where half know me as Classically Abby, and that's it. And half know me as Ben Shapiro's sister. <laughs> and is it a political, non-political mix then? Like the people who yeah, I think it's a little bit of a mix, and I think it's people who aren't into politics, but are into cultural conservatism, and that's cultural yeah. conservatives. Right. I think those are the women who follow yeah. me and know me as classically yeah. Abby. Right. People who yeah. are into politics and are into kind of the commentary on what's going on day to day, yes. they, they know me as Ben Shapiro's sister. And so, and so remind me, just, just give me a few minutes on that. Where did you guys grow up, and how, how is this... Not surprising what you guys do. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, we grew up in we grew up in Los Angeles, but both of my parents are actually from Chicago. So oh, ah, Midwest, yes. <laughs> that. very much so. So I never really considered myself a a Los Angeles person. Yeah, yeah I don't um, put in there today. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Never interested in going back. Um, but that's where we grew up, and I was the youngest. My brother's the oldest. Uh, there's a 10 year difference between us. 10 years? Oh, 10 years. really? Yeah. I realize that. Wow. Okay. Well, there's four kids. So okay. there's um, a 10 year difference between the two okay. of us. And, um, you know, we, my parents always talked about values. They talked about conservatism and politics. And I grew up religious. So all of these things, you're, you're, it was funny. When I went to college, I remember thinking to myself, people don't talk about this stuff like 75% of the time. <laughs> I oh, thought that yeah. was normal. Same, same, same family. Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, we're talking about, I guess, just like life and movies and, uh, you know, food. That's what you talk about most of the time with, you know, other people. But my yeah. family, yeah. you're yeah. talking about this stuff all the time. So my brother obviously went to into this stuff at, I don't know, 16, because he was at uh, UCLA. 
And I was always conservative, but kind of kept it under wraps because of what I did. I started okay. opera at 16 and I never, I never could talk about it. It was like, no. And actually I only, people figured out that Ben was my brother when the alt-right found me. This was a whole debacle, uh, like two, I guess, I guess it now would be like three or four years ago, four years ago where the alt-right figured out that I was Ben's sister from an opera singing video I had put up as an audition tape on YouTube. And they just, it was horrible. They attacked me. They were saying all these things and I was totally unprepared for it. Yeah. But I also thought to myself, okay, well, everyone's going to find out I'm Ben's sister. And if they're going to find out I'm Ben's sister, it better be on my terms right now in the opera world. Or, and people might be like more amenable to hearing because clearly this isn't in my favor. <laughs> like people yeah. are treating me so horribly. Um, but then after that, I realized, you know, it's important for me to just be vocal because when that happened, this was the craziest thing. When that happened, about five friends that I had never spoken to about politics in the opera world came to me privately and said, I'm actually conservative and I don't talk to anyone about this. People don't really realize, see, I happen to believe that that silent majority is just massive, massive, because it, it comports with, with human nature. People like to go along to get along. And if you're going to be attacked, people would rather just shut up, you know, and live quietly. There's very few people like us, really, who are going to go out in front of a camera and just say what we're going to say. So it's so important to remember that, especially because virtually everything people see in the news, in the in the media period is obviously the other side. So um, that's of course where YouTube and um, the internet comes in great handy. <laughs> well, it can also be a bad thing. That's getting, you know, beginning to cancel culture, but okay. Um, so let's get into your, to your site and your videos, which are awesome. Um, you focus a fair amount. I don't know what the percentages are. You feel free to share if you like um, on fashion, beauty, and skincare or fashion beauty rather. And you had one video where you wrote about how, the, what the difference is between um, when it's okay to focus on beauty and when it's not, or what that means, which I thought was excellent in this era of putting on an obese person in the magazines or whatever and saying, this is great and fine because you're, you know, you're a person too or whatever. Well, duh, that's not the point, right? That's not okay. That's not healthy. We should not be holding that up versus you're a China doll and you should look beautiful all the time as a gir young girl and, and all your you know identity should be wrapped up in the, the way you look. So mm -hmm. tell everybody what you kind of said in that video. Well, I'm trying to remember exactly which one. Well, I mean, what are you, okay, yeah, <laughs> say what you're thinking now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've talked, about, I've talked about this in a few different iterations oh. on my channel. Um, definitely talking just about beauty standards. Um, is that what, the yeah, what I most recently was talking about is the difference between good beauty standards and bad beauty standards. Yeah. So there are some good beauty standards. The idea that health is related to beauty is actually very good. It means that it teaches us and encourages us as women and men to yeah. treat our bodies the best way that we can and to eat healthily and to exercise. And that's reflected in an attractive body. Like how great is that? Yeah. It would be so much worse if like what was considered attractive was being incredibly underweight, which has been a style in the past, but I would say nowadays much less so, and or being incredibly obese, which mm -hmm. would not be healthy for anyone. Clearly with COVID pandemic, we know that that was like the right. number one right. exactly. thing that would cause people to, you know, to catch it. So I am a huge proponent of health being a signifier of beauty. I think that's like great. Now, the bad beauty standards are the things that we can't change. You know, your nose shape, I talk about this a lot. I have a very unique nose. I am Jewish. I have a very, as some would say, Jewish nose. Being in, you know, a society that looks at certain noses and thinks that that's better or worse, you know, we, should, we shouldn't we should lean into that. I think it's good for us to have diversity in things like that where you can't change it. Or another good example, which 80% of women have is cellulite. The idea that Photoshop has made us think. Yes. Yeah. That women are literally like you described, China dolls, where we have nothing on our skin, we have no stretch marks, we have no, I mean, yeah. that's unhealthy because that's stuff you cannot change. And it's important for us to, I think, see it more and see that it's natural. I don't think Photoshop is ever a good thing. It's, I think it plays, wreaks havoc on women's, you know, internal monologue about how I should look when you literally no one can look like that. Agreed. I totally agree. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and is that part of your, um, so I saw you did, and I know you're not alone. There's a lot of videos out there because my daughter watches them. She's 21. She loves that stuff. Um, watching people put on going from nothing on their face in the morning when they wake up, which is very bold and awesome of you, to looking beautiful. Now, is part of that to, just to show people how to put on makeup or to show the reality versus, um, you know, uh, looking? Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's definitely a mixture. I mean, it's practical for me to show you, like, start to finish. But it also, I have struggled with acne in the past, really bad acne. Mm -hmm. And I had to, I had to go to a dermatologist and work it out. It's awful. And, it's oh, terrible. it's horrible. It's, it's it terrible. breaks down your, it makes you so insecure. It's, it's just terrible. really hard. And, you know, I tried everything besides Accutane. Like I didn't try anything. I didn't try anything internally because I was a singer and I was being very careful about my body. And I don't regret that because I personally don't want to like, I went on birth control for it, which I regret it. Birth control was not good for me. Um, but I, I went, I ended up just doing the regimen of skincare that my dermatologist had recommended. And one of my biggest tips with that is when the doctor says wait six weeks, he means wait six weeks to start seeing results. That was, I kind of remember this with my kids with Accutane, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I always thought that if you were, if you, you needed to have everything cleared up by six weeks. So by three weeks, I was like, nothing is changing. Why am I still doing this? And when I finally started to realize, okay, no, you need to start and just see results by six weeks. Yeah. Then that's when my skin really started to clear up, but I struggled with it a lot. And so that's when I actually learned to do makeup was mm -hmm. to cover it up so that I had better, you know, yeah. better confidence. The spotiness, the mm -hmm. spotiness versus the, yeah. Yeah. And so now when I put my skin on, on camera, I don't suffer as badly with acne, although depending on the time of the month, that's different. But, um, I want people to still see that my skin isn't perfect. It definitely isn't perfect. Yeah. And no one's is. Yeah. And I love that. And I do think the few, very, very, very few Hollywood starlets or whoever they are that's occasionally come out and show themselves un, undone up or whatever, um, are doing like a huge, huge service to people. I think they need to do a hell of a lot more of that. I agree. To break apart the whole facade of Hollywood. It's just, that's another conversation. <laughs> um, you had on somebody, Amanda Ensing. What was the deal with the boycott Sephora? What, um, what was that? Yeah. All? I never, I didn't. Well, so, yeah, Amanda Ensing is a YouTuber. She has, uh, I think almost a million and a half subscribers. And in the last year, she came out publicly for Trump. And oh. when she did, obviously that was a huge hullabaloo, but Sephora later passed after this had happened, um, wanted her to do a sponsored video. And so she did, and she had looked over their contract and all of that. And after posting the video, Sephora got one comment, I believe on their page from one person who shops there saying, I can't believe you sponsored Amanda Ensing. She is such a you know bad person and she doesn't encourage inclusivity and diversity and all of these things just because mm -hmm. of course, pro-Trump. And they pulled her sponsorship. And the, it was, which is a huge deal. I mean, these kinds of sponsorships are how people make money on the internet and they pulled her sponsorship because, and cited that it was because they don't like to work with people who aren't diverse and who aren't inclusive, which is ironic given that they don't want to work with people who have <laughs> viewpoints. So she uh, started this whole boycott Sephora campaign in response to that saying, I'm a conservative who is very, like, I'm all about like loving people. She's very Christian. And you guys are, you're the ones who are not being yeah, inclusive. Right. Right. Oh um, my man, I didn't realize that. I didn't even know there was a political thing, but well, I figured there was, I guess there's boycotting, but okay. <laughs> All right, let's get into um, our favorite topic here at the Suzanne Banker Show, and that's dating and relationships. And I, um, I was thrilled to see how much content you really have on this on your site. So I want to make sure everybody goes to your site to read all of this stuff that also much of, does it all have a video component or just some of them? So I, you know, nowadays it's almost all a video, uh, a video. Um, but back in the day I was doing blogs and the blogs are just blog posts. And if you subscribe to, sorry, shameless plug really quick. <laughs> if you subscribe to my Substack newsletter, I do a weekly article and often those are about relationships as well. Excellent. Okay. So I just pulled a few that, um, that's, that stuck out to me the most. Um, 
the first one is, I mean, I mean, I've written about this ad nauseum, so obviously we're like-minded. It just says straight out, ladies, stop hooking up. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I think the last one I wrote, literally, Abby, it started with ladies too, and it said, ladies, close your legs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, wh what the hell with hooking up? You know, I mean, it's, I, I keep saying to people, you know, when I was young, Yes, that was like a thing, but it was on the periphery. There was no name for it. This would have been in the 80s. Mm -hmm. People, even in college in the 80s, I was on the East Coast, people had relationships. They were involved with people for a length of time. The idea that you would go sleep with someone and just, that's the end of it. You knew about it, you heard about it, but it was absolutely still on the periphery. And you would still look at it like, what? You know, that, that's, that's the 80s. So I'm not sure at what point the hooking up became the norm, but it was definitely gradual. And I guess, when were you in college? What years? Uh, what year did I graduate? Uh, I started, I graduated 2015. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. So tell me how somebody of your generation being raised the way you were, how does that, how did that fly when you got to college? How does, how does that, what, just tell me whatever you want to say about hooking up. <laughs> I have so much to say. I'm going to be quiet now and let you talk. No, absolutely. So I um, am very open with my subscribers that I was not like a little angel when I was in um, my master's program. When I was in college, I was still living at home. So that made things yeah. a lot better. And it's something I generally actually think is very important for people going to college, which I know many would disagree with me. But I think that college campuses college I have a lot of issues with in general just from like the woke perspective but yep. college campuses are just a, a breeding ground for young people to do stupid things yeah, they are if, no question exactly so living at home you know that does cut down on that a bit yeah, sure. um and so I didn't really engage in that and I was dating for marriage when I moved to when I moved to New York I was still dating for marriage but Honestly, what happened was that I had a few really bad experiences with men and then was like, okay, I'm going to do this now where I just, I'm empowered lies. Biggest lie any woman has ever been told that you're empowered. And when notice you that it came, sorry, notice that it came after the bad experiences, which is always where feminists get young women too, because you're vulnerable, right? And you want to hold on to something that feels empowering, but of course isn't. Go ahead. Well, you, yeah, a hundred percent. You feel like you're the one making the decisions and you feel like you're the one in control, oh, which is those bad men. Yeah, 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 exactly. And of course, what are you doing? You're giving men like bad men exactly what they want. Exactly. So <laughs> it's, it's a terrible cycle, but you know, I think what ends up happening is that women are told that they should be empowered and should be going out and embracing their sexuality and what they end up doing is hurting themselves and hurting their not prospects in the sense of men won't date them afterwards but dating is not as you're not getting what you want out of dating you're not going to find a guy who will want to marry you and raise a family with you if you're treating yourself with such disrespect that's a, a huge thing for me is like you're not treating yourself with respect if you think that you should be sharing this most intimate part of you with everybody. And, you know, there, of course, there's a million other problems with it, right? STDs and, and getting pregnant. I was a virgin when I got married, but my version of hooking up was always the, the PG version, or <laughs> maybe PG-13. But um, I just, I always think that women don't think that they're going to benefit from this, and they're not. And it's upsetting. Yeah, I think the part that's, that's, not, that's not addressed enough, of course, is the emotional fallout of that right? The psychological, the, the, the torment really for so many of them, um, because no one, no one told them that their bodies are different than men's and that they do attach much more easily or are much less able to detach. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Um, and, and, and because men and women are supposedly the same, right? And so why, if they're doing it, I'll do it. And there's no problem. And, and training your body out of that, the idea that you should train your body and your mind out of that is so dangerous because then when you find the right person, it's really hard to break that habit of like, I hooked up with you and that's it. Like that, it is not going anywhere from here. Whereas this is like a very honest thing for me, which is when the first time my husband and I, you know, 
had sex after we got married, I turned to him and I was like, I honestly can't imagine doing this with anyone I wasn't 100% committed to. Uh, it's inconceivable to me. I know, I know. And I would say this back in the day, I've always said it and, and I've always been the odd bird. What's wrong with you, you know? Um, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> and, and the thing is when it seems, again, like everybody else, uh, it's just, I see it now with, um, you can, you know, going back to what you were saying about the way you present yourself, a guy knows within a minute which type of girl you are. Nobody wants to hear this, but it's the facts. And it has everything to do with how you present yourself. Before you've even opened your mouth, he knows whether you want him to look at your boobs or your brain, right? Or your head or your, what you're saying. It's very obvious to them. And so then you have to say, okay, well, th or then I would say to them, what is it that you want them to look at? Now, if you're, if you're going in there looking for a relationship, then you're not going to get it if you're um, um, molding him to look in another direction. So ultimately it comes down to you. What do you want and how are you going to get there? Yeah. Um, and obviously hooking up isn't it unless that's really what you want, which I don't buy from that anyway. But, you know, I mean, I, I, I some few outliers, but not for most people. Yeah. And to be, to be honest and clear, I also have a video on my channel, which is men stop hooking up. Yeah. I yeah. think that, no. men, <laughs> you know, I agree that men have less of a, they're, it's easier for men to hook up. Like they're not going to have as quick of a fallout for what, as women do. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that they should hook up either. No. And in, fact, in fact, I've had people say this to me because I have, we have a son and a daughter and they, they both got the same message about this, that this is not for playing around. It's just that the only distinction is, but this body is capable of detaching much more easily than this body is. That's it. It doesn't mean you could do it. It just means that's a fact, you know, a biological fact. I didn't, yeah. make that, you know, so, okay. Um, all right, so, so you mentioned this. So let's move into to the ladies. Let's talk about dating for marriage. And then we're gonna come back to um, um, some more, but let, I'm gonna focus on this one because this one, first of all, let's, let, I just want to tell everybody that you wrote, the, I mean, see, I keep saying writing, but you're doing videos. You're all video. You're all video. I'm new to it still in the last six months at my age. And you know, YouTubers start young and I was a writer for many, many years. Um, and so that I'm going the op opposite direction. Okay. So you have a video where you did a great job explaining um, about compatibility and chemistry. It was awesome. I'm really, really impressed. I love the way you did it. You said, you guys have probably heard this before, but I have a little different spin on it. Um, and well, first of all, I'll let you go ahead and just tell people about that. And then I'll move to the next thing. This is like my favorite thing to talk about. Okay. So I'm really glad you're asking me. <laughs> personal for me, because you literally described, I was married before, no kids. And that's that you literally described my story. That was why I was so riveted. Well, and you know, I, I dated plenty before I met my husband, even though we, we got married young, I started dating young. So it was, uh, I had experience and that I, which I think is important when I'm talking to people, I'm able to say, you know, I'm not judging you cause I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, you know, here's my theory. There's chemistry and compatibility and you need both to find the right person and get married and have a long lasting relationship. But there are chemistry guys and there are compatibility guys and chemistry guys are the guys that you fall head over heels for like it is a two seconds we can talk all night our personalities are perfect for each other and it is intense mm -hmm. and it is in, infatuating like you are obsessed really it's almost obsessive yep. and in those relationships you are going to constantly feel on edge that the relationship is going to end because you don't have the compatibility. And you say to yourself over and over, we're going to last because we can't last. We can't not last. We're so perfect together. Despite the fact that he doesn't want to get married. He doesn't want to have children. He doesn't share my faith. He doesn't live in my state. Like <laughs> all, the things just that are all five of them, all five. There's, there's more, but that's pretty funny. <laughs> oh my God. Despite the fact that he doesn't have all of these things that you need to have a good relationship, we are too perfect for us not to last. Yeah. And those relationships go up and down like a roller coaster. And that is what people confuse for passion because people assume that for you to have 
passion, this really intense anxiety is not passion. But people think that anxiety about a love and relationship and needing to be near that person because you're afraid you're going to lose them. They think what they see in TV. That's they've been fed this their whole lives. Imagine right. if you were, I, I said in one of my books, imagine if you were raised in the 20s or 30s or 40s before all this stuff, you wouldn't necessarily think that's a positive thing. Yep. Right? But yep. that's what you see all the time or read about. So you think that's what you're supposed to have. Oh, I found it. Right. right. Exactly. And I think this is so common for women, especially young women. This is the kind of relationship that you are heartbroken over for months. Like just, you feel like I'm never going to find something that good again. Then you have compatibility guy. Compatibility guy is the guy who on paper, like every single thing is perfect. He wants five kids. I want five kids. He wants to live in this community. Perfect. Me too. Like it's just like everything on paper looks perfect, but you do not like being around this person. Like there's no chemistry. You just don't. I have a question. About him. I have a question. About him. And then I never experienced that. The only time I experienced that was with someone who asked me out and I, I had that feeling about, so I said, no. So how does a person get into even get that far into the dating? If you literally have no traction to them, I think that's so fascinating. You know, I had it at a couple different times in a couple of different ways. Okay. So the first, for the setup. <laughs> yes. Often, often it comes from a setup the, and they see the compatibility. Obviously they're not going to know how the chemistry works out when they're setting you up. Um, but long distance, long distance relationships, depending on how you do them. Cause my long distance relationship with my husband worked out because I had implemented a few rules. But oh, wait, I'll come back to that. I want to, cause I wanted to ask you about long distance dating. Yes. Okay. We, we'll, we'll put a, a note in it. Um, but the first guy I ever dated long distance, we dated for nine months and we never spent more than two days together in a row. And so we sort of felt like chemistry because it was all it was all online. It's all but, FaceTime, right? It was FaceTime, okay. Yeah, yeah. it was all videos, and chem uh, the compatibility was there. And then the first time we spent two weeks together in person, it was like this is the worst. Like we do, I do not like this. I do not want to do this. This is wrong. So that's the first way that I that I've been in that situation. The second way is something called shidduch dating. I don't know if you've heard of this. Yeah. Um, so in the Jewish community, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sorry. In the Jewish community, it's like a resume. You send a resume with all of, ba literally the checklist. <laughs> and you have people look at the two lists and say, okay, like, and you'll have your interests and stuff listed. And they'll say, okay, this person matches with this person. We'll set them up on a date. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily turn into a relationship, but it can be a date that you go on where the compatibility is all there, but the chemistry just doesn't work. Right. Which actually can be good because you've got the compatibility, you know that works. So you just have to spend one night together. I mean, see now today I have to explain, <laughs> spend an evening together for a few hours. And if it, if it's not there, you just move on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm all, I'm fine with the shit up system. I think it's a beautiful situation. <laughs> um, but so the chem, the compatibility person is the person that you don't feel that heartbreak over, but you constantly question, did I make a mistake? Like, should I have felt that chemistry? because it was so easy on paper, but in person it didn't work. But maybe, maybe I should be with that person. The right person, you have both. The right person, you have chemistry and you have compatibility. And it's, but because you have the compatibility, it's not that anxiety version of passion. It's the calm passion where you know the person's gonna be there the next day. And so people don't recognize it because it's not overwhelming anxiety that you're gonna lose them. They think that they don't they don't have passion in those relationships, which is absolutely wrong. Right, and so, right because they don't want that one. They think that's the the boring one or whatever. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's why yeah, that was such an important distinction to make. Really love that. And of course, you're you know, mixed in there. You're talking about <coughs> you talk a lot about excuse me, dating for marriage versus dating for fun. And this gets in, so I have a book coming out in August. We should get together again and talk about that book because it's called How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched. 12-step <laughs> program for marriage-minded women. Love it. So this is a detox. So this, it's, it's, in, it's divided up into two parts. Part one is the four lies the culture tells. And part two is the 12-step program, your detox. You get out of that mindset and into the mindset that works. And it's, it is basically dating for marriage as, as opposed to for fun. And my argument is that you you save so much time if you date 
with purpose, which is the way it always was until recently. And now with there's with people not knowing who's supposed to do what anymore, and that breakdown between men and women, or that line, I guess, between like, here's how you be a man, here's how you're a woman, and here's you know how it works. People are flailing about in the dark with absolutely no roadmap, literally just taking what comes and giving no thought in terms of the long haul, which is very new. I mean, even as recent as my generation, people did think longer term when you're dating. And so that allows you to get rid of, that allows you to not waste time because just get on the same page or get off. What's the situationship thing? I heard this, I'm like, what the hell is that? Hey, what's the situation? Get in or get out. Just figure it out whether or not you're on the same page earlier on. And you're just going to waste prime fertile, I might add, years if you go on for 10 years with that crap. Totally. I would 100% agree with this. I mean, this is something I talk about all the time. It's, it's, so, it's so important for women. The fertility thing isn't a joke. We want to have children. It's important. Spending three years with someone who you are not going to have a future with which does happen by the way, I know many women who have done this, is to me devastating. Like you want control over your timeline, that is not the way to do it. Because you know what's gonna end. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they think that you know they're gonna get control and have, again, I like to use this annoying version of female empowerment because I think that female empowerment exists, but this is not how. Yep. Um, they use this version of female empowerment where I'm in control of my life because I get to make bad choices. Like, no. Right, no, right, right. That's like proving something if I have the power to go out and make bad choices for 10 years and waste this time. What, exactly. what, what? Empowerment <laughs> is getting it right, not getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that, you know, dating for marriage, it doesn't mean that you can't have fun while you're dating. Right. Absolutely not. It just means that you're not going to a, waste your time, and B, break your own heart getting involved with someone that you don't have a future with. I always find it interesting to, as somebody who's literally, I mean, with the exception of a year in between my first husband and my second husband, I've, I'm a relationship gal. I'm not a good dater. You know, I've, I've had basically three men in my life, right? Two of them were husbands and <laughs> another one for a couple of years. So, so that, that's my comfort zone. But I, I, I always try to imagine people who are dating without, like, what are you talking about? If you're not talking about your values, your goals, your past, your future, like to me, that's so normal. So I can't imagine getting embroiled in a relationship with someone for whom there isn't a match in that regard. And if there wasn't, I would just get out, you know, yeah. I think that's so common. You know, I, I, I never did that either but I try to understand it so that I can address it in the sense of like, why would you do that? What, what would make women want to get involved in these situationships? <laughs> and I think often it's, it's not a, a conscious choice. It comes out of fear. They don't want to get rejected. So they allow themselves to get taken advantage of. Women don't want to get rejected by saying, what is this? What, what are we doing? Is this a real relationship? Are we moving forward? So instead they are friends that engage, you know, sexually or however, and basically date without any of the strings attached that they really want, but they're afraid to ask for. Yep, exactly. That's, oh my gosh, that's totally what this book is going to be addressing. It's like, throw that out, throw that out. There's a whole nother way of doing this. Here it is. <laughs> I can't okay. wait to see it. Yay. I know. Let's, let's talk when that, when that comes out. Okay. I want to talk about another article that I really, really loved. I'm going to read a little bit from it called texting is ruining dating. And it caught my eye because I was literally in the midst of helping a friend's daughter um, maneuver this texting situation with a new potential gentleman. Um, and, and I, you know, really quickly, just the male female thing, you have to lead it as a woman as far as where that direction is going to go with the, with the relationship, because a guy will go, well, he'll respond to whatever you're commanding, right? So if you only command and allow or not allow, well, yeah, I guess allow texting, he may just continue on with that because that's, he's not thinking any deeper. That's just what people do, you know, teach them, you know, show them there's another way to say, hey, I don't want to do this. I really want to get to know you, but I want to see you. I want it to be real. And this, this is, this texting thing is fine for later when we're, you know, we know each other, but it doesn't work now. 
So you had a, a really great description of why texting ruins dating in this article. And you wrote out, uh, you wrote, you started out by talking about a couple of friends that you knew and they seemed like a good fit and there was chemistry, but there was never a second date. And the reason is because they started texting and then all these miscommunications abounded and then it went south. And then you said texting is poison for relationships, especially at the beginning, because about a million things can go wrong. Totally agree. Mainly because you read whole words, you wrote quote, whole words of meaning into something that was completely innocuous. But then you wrote about the two main issues, the amount of time between answers and the fact that, well, let's do it one by one. So let's talk about that. The amount of time between answers, why is that so toxic? Well, you know, you would never have a conversation with someone and in the middle of the conversation have someone leave the room for two hours. <laughs> Isn't that great? Love it, love the visual. You know, it's just, it's not natural. No. And this is what happens is people will treat texting. Look, if you treat texting like a, a, a beeper, like a, a beeper used to be used, like meet me here at this time yeah. or I'm yep. here, yep. you know, that is fine. Like, go ahead. Easy, understandable. If you are having a full blown conversation with someone, which happens, and then all of a sudden the person gets a phone call where they need to take a work call or something like that they're gone for two hours and you're like we were in the middle of something very important and you don't know why they're not answering you i it is the most stressful thing in the world when you are in a situation like that and it's why i never want people to do that because it's horrible and on top of it when you have that much time between texts people can think of what to say you know it, it really, you can be the most charming, response, right? Yeah, exactly. You can be the most charming person over text and in person be a clod. And <laughs> you would not know because they have 20 minutes to respond. And that is considered okay and good etiquette, okay etiquette in texting or in texting land. It's okay to, to take the time or not take the time. It shouldn't be okay, but it's acceptable. Like people will not, you're not immediately getting broken up with if you have a, a 45 minute gap between texts that, you know, women will feel maybe a little on edge, but they're not going to break up with you. If you were to, again, be at a table at dinner on a date and the guy were to leave for 45 minutes. Yeah. You're going to break up with that guy at the end of the meal. You know, texting has created a, a non, <laughs> And not, and not okay version of how conversations go. Right. And it gives you a false impression of a person as right. well. So when you get together, you're going to see something very different, of course. That person who took 45 minutes or two hours to respond and come up with this great response, and then all of a sudden you're in a relationship and, wow, you're getting a completely different person. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's just horribly stressful when you are in a situation where, like I said, you're in a conversation with someone and it feels really comfortable and easy and all of a sudden they're just not answering. And they could have a very good reason or they could not. Yes, that's they don't know. And that's where all the angst comes from. They're like, well, I don't know. And, blah, 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 blah. and then it's all waste, more wasted time, more wasted hours. Yes. Because you don't, if you don't know, you don't know, you don't know how to respond. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, my husband and I were very strict when we dated. We didn't text, at, and we were long distance. We did not text about anything important. So there was no texting in my world of dating, but even today, my husband and I, who text constantly all the time, I mean, 23 years of marriage, I'm sure we, <laughs> we've been doing it since it was, I don't know. I don't even know when we started. Five years ago, when did texting become a thing? Probably long <laughs> that. I lose track of time. But nothing's more than a paragraph ever. And I see these people with these long, like, what are you doing? I could never mm -hmm. have a conversation of that length with somebody. It wouldn't even dawn on me to do that. Yep. No, these, that's what people do. People are so disconnected from each other. I mean, the fact that we don't take phone calls, really, there's like an anti-phone call. Culture. No. Oh, I see this with my kids. I'm like, pick up that phone, have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my son was sort of he was raised to look, you want to have a date, you're going to call or you're not going to text her. And he did that. And um, I don't think his friends do. And that I don't, I mean, I mean, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that people are not, we have horrible attention spans because of social media. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to text so we can do something else while we're texting. If you're on the phone, you can't do something else while you're on the phone. Oh, yeah, I guess so. I never thought about it like doing something else while I'm texting, but yeah, I guess you're right. 
you can watch a TV show, you can be doing work and just like briefly take a break to write a response and then go back to work. As opposed to if you're on the phone, you're on the phone and someone's going to hear if you're watching or if you're, if you're working. It would be such a great exercise for a young person who's never known anything other than texting to do like a writing assignment. I was a former English teacher in my um, 20s it, to do a, like a writing assignment of putting yourself um, in the, in the boat of somebody like myself who grew up with telephones where you literally had to sit there with the phone in the room, in the mm -hmm. chair, and you couldn't move. I mean, it was a really big deal when we got cordless phones. Wait, yeah, cordless phones. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just my age. But yeah, you're on the phone, right, with it. And I do a psychological exercise to what, what, that, what that means for your relationship, whether it's a friendship or a boyfriend, girlfriend, how that would change things and what that would mean from a psychological perspective and for the strength of the relationship. And then just all the nuance around that, that would be really fascinating to be forced think so to think about that. Um, yeah, anyway, okay, going down a different road. So then you wrote um, another one that was really fun called The Map of Relationships. I liked that one because my husband and I are an I and I too. Which you and you're also so tell everybody about your 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 theory on that. The M is the moderate, I think. And the yeah, I. you have to remind me. What did I say? Because this was written a while ago. The M was a moderate. The I was I don't know, but it meant intense. Is that what it is? Okay, so intense. Mm -hmm. We're talking about two different personalities essentially, and that of course there's not everyone falls into a strict box, but basically intense personalities are more moderate. I guess you meant more relaxed, go with the flow types. Mm -hmm. My husband and I are both very intense. And you were, and you and your husband, I guess, are, and you were describing that and about how it's just challenging each other to grow and to move forward and that that's so fun. And so, you know, it could be bad. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But, you're reminding me. It's yeah. coming back. It's coming back. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel, so this is my, the only concern I have with this article is I don't want to offend people who are in a different, who are in a different kind of relationship. And I don't think that I, yeah, I don't think that I, that I took that stance, but my, my point was, is that when you are in an intense, so the idea is right, that you have two kinds of people. Now, uh, this is very broad swaths. You have people who have very intense opinions and who, you know, passionate and it's hard to get them to, to move and they're very stubborn. And then you have people who are moderate, who still have those, you know, strong ideas and everything, but they're comfortable, you know, sometimes taking a back seat yep. or just allowing to be, like you said, go with the flow. When you're in a relationship that's intense and intense, it like two intense people, it means that you're going to have some more <laughs> arguments, but that's not a bad thing because it forces you to A, learn how to compromise, but B, to grow and to change and become better. And this is something that my husband and I, you know, people will say, I've never been in an argument. We've been married for 20 years. We've never gotten in an argument. My husband and I are like, what are you talking about? We can't even imagine because it's not that we fight. We never are mean or anything like that. That is not what I'm talking about because I don't think that like fighting to hurt the other person is ever okay. But I mean, we will have arguments because we disagree on things. We have different views and we want to get to the right answer. And yep. so when we argue, it actually allows us to figure out what that right answer is. And if you're in a relationship that's more like intense, moderate, then often what will happen and what can happen is the intense person takes the lead and is not challenged and not actually, but in the sense of like, doesn't necessarily get pushed to grow. And the moderate person isn't necessarily pushed to grow. And I generally, it, my personal preference is relationships where you do have people asking more of each other and asking each other to grow and be better. Well, the reason why it interested me is um, because I don't know that you know this or not, but a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called The Alpha Female's Guide to Men and Marriage. <laughs> that was part memoir and part self-help. And um, I have a strong-willed personality. My husband has a strong-willed personality. And that book was really about my finding my way to a happy or well, he and I together finding a way um, to a middle ground that where there was more peace and less, you know, of this. Um, and then that led into a real um, study of personality because half of it's really about personality, which is what you're talking about. What you're calling moderate, you can call laid back. I use the terms alpha, beta. I don't even know if I would use those terms again today because I think 
the, those have connotations, but just more like type A, type B, you know, more relaxed versus more intense. And that is something that people have to deal with when you get married. Everybody has to deal with when they get married. And so my daughter, for example, is more comfortable not needing to, you know, rule the roost or whatever kind of thing. Um, and would, would probably say she needs to make sure she's always, you know, um, not subsuming her needs because she doesn't feel so strongly about having this or that, you know, a certain way. Um, and she grew up watching her mom or dad. It's a very intense household, a very positive household, but a very intense <laughs> one. So her, um, yeah, yeah, it's just very interesting stuff. And it was fascinating to me. So I finally just sat down to write a book and help myself and kind of get it together and then try to help others whose personalities are, are very type A. And then also talking about the male female thing, the masculine and feminine, how that's designed to work together. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's what made me think of that when you wrote about the map of relationships. That was good. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, I think that, you know, I, I would say in some things I am more laid back and in something my husband's, my husband's more laid back. And I think that's what does, you know, even you guys out, right? Is that the times that my husband is very, very passionate, I'm not always that passionate. And I'm like, okay, you, you get to choose. That's totally fine. And, and it's ability to do that. that's so important though. And that's, that's the kicker. If you're, if you're dealing with somebody who's unable to do that, that's where the conflict comes in. That's what I end up dealing with in my coaching. Mm. My coaching clients is that there's so much of that control that they're not understanding that actually letting go of that actually will get you where you want to go. Not, not, not forcing yourself. So anyway. Okay. So let's, um, let's, I want to close out before we close out. I want to talk about, um, another one that you wrote called Debunking the Feminist Lie. And it probably isn't the only article you've written about feminism. And I'm gonna reference the recent conversation you had with Candace Owens, which was fun because she got into, she's written a lot about feminism as well. And I think probably all three of us are on very much the same page on that topic. So how, how has, how, I guess, how do I say this? What's the feminist lie? Let's start with that. There's so many of them. I don't know how to- I, know, you know. I was gonna say that's very broad. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me- <laughs> Here's what I like to say, just maybe to, to make feminists angry, okay. uh, is that I am a feminist, but I'm not the kind of feminist you think I am, <laughs> um, which is probably what Christina Hoff Summers would say, right? So Christina Hoff Summers, I'm reading her book right now, and it has been, you know, it, it falls exactly in line with what I thought and is giving me even more, more yeah. to think about, which is great. Uh, her book is Who Stole Feminism, for those who haven't read it. And uh, I'm, a, I'm an equity feminist. I believe that women should have legal and equal rights, you know, in, in the world. And we do. We have accomplished this. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. We have equal opportunity to accomplish whatever we want to do. And that is incredible. And I think it is so empowering, right? Using their word, but it is our word too. Empowering. Gender feminism is the idea that females are born oppressed. We are automatically victims of a patriarchal society and everything needs to be torn down and rebuilt because we are always going to be victims no matter how well we succeed no matter how good we we do we're still always going to be victims it's always, that, rigged. Always, rigged. That. it's always rigged it's always rigged even if you win that to me is the feminist lie the feminist lie is that women are victims because we're not we're so strong we can succeed not only in the same venues that men are succeeding, but in the ways that women are unique. And that is huge. Like we control so many outcomes of men. That to me is the thing that, that blows my mind and is so frowned upon by feminists and drives me crazy. And is that's, when I, the is. that's where the power is. They just mm -hmm. define the power differently. They define it with money and success and status. Right. Mm -hmm. You're defining it right now in terms of what really matters, which is your relationships at home. Yes, 100 percent. And also in society, like we are the backbone of society. If women are not running the running the show, <laughs> in a sense, things get out of control. The fact that we are the ones who determine how men will act, because it comes down to women have the power to control how societies turn out and civilizations survive. Right. Families and communities, that's, they're run by women, mostly. Exactly. You're the one raising your son. If your son turns out poorly, that's on you. Absolutely. And if your son turns out great, that's on you too. How cool is that? You, you make your husband better 
you make your son the man you want him to be. Like, and then of course, so not only we are, are we influencing and have the biggest amount of power in the way that our men turn out, but we as women are influencing each other and we're all talking to each other. So I don't understand how we can believe that women don't have power. I, it, it drives me crazy because I'm like, I have never felt like a victim in America because A, we have that, you know, equity feminism, but also as women, we control the men around us. So <laughs> It's a completely different take on the same subject that gets absolutely no coverage, none. It exists and you can find it. And the very first time I sat down to write about this was 20 years ago and I read Who Stole Feminism? And um, I was aware of the other side of uh, the book that I ended up writing was called The Flip Side of Feminism. So it's out there, but you, it's, not in, it's not in mass form. So. So there is no understanding of anything other than what it has, what it is presented as, which of course is that there's no differences between women and men, and that the only way to be empowered is to be sexually uh, free and free of men and children and pursuing a career and making a lot of money. Like that's that's the end of the conversation about feminism, um, as far as what young women receive. So what you just said, while it's obviously true and it's the real power, you have to really dig to find it, right? Yeah. No, it's impossible. And it's honestly, it was funny. I don't even think I, I'm not trying to give myself credit here, but I don't even think I, I read it somewhere. I think I just realized it. <laughs> like I was sitting. Well, you could experience it yourself and have a, a lightning bolt, lightning, whatever that is, light bulb moment. Light bulb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that way, for sure. I think for most people, they probably do it from the, get the, um, have the light bulb go off from experience. Totally. And it was like, oh my gosh, I get to choose how I live in this world. Like I get to choose what the world around me looks like and I get to choose, meaning my own personal circle and I get to influence society. And that is so cool. I would, I love being a woman. I think it's the greatest thing ever. And I, you know, I, I, I feel bad for women who despise that they were born this way because they've been lied to. Yeah. And that to me is so upsetting. You want to be happy, immediately throw all that out. You want to be unhappy, believe you're a victim. Like if you believe you're a victim, then you're just- You're screwed. There's no, you're, there's yeah, no exactly. There, you, there, there's, because the, the idea of victimization and victimhood, it exists. There are people who have been victims and who have been victimized, that exists. But those people would hate if you called them victims. <laughs> I know that for myself, I've been in situations, bad situations where I was victimized and you come out the other side as a survivor. You're not a victim anymore. Right. So calling yourself a victim constantly, no matter what the hap no matter what happens or how successful you are, it's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for unhappiness. Which is why the, the term the term empowerment is, is such a joke and so ironic because you cannot empower <laughs> someone by simultaneously telling them they're permanently victims. How does that work? <laughs> so yeah. true. So true. Uh, well, this has been really great, Abby. This has been I've, really nice. I've loved being on. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. So tell everybody how they can best find your awesome stuff. Yeah, so you can find me pretty much on all social media at Classically Abby. Um, you can also follow me on YouTube, my channel. Please subscribe there and you can uh, find me at Classically Abby there as well. And if you would like to get access to exclusive content, I actually have a Substack newsletter, which I earlier mentioned, and you'll get a weekly article and two exclusive videos every month. Awesome. Sounds great. And uh, do you ever do videos on your channel? Well, I mean, I know you've had a few. But what do you mean? Do you ever interview other people on your channel? Oh, yes. I do do interviews. <laughs> so come on for my book. It'll be great. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's all about this. It's basically this exact thing, but how to get it right you know, get that information early on so that you can map out a life that, that works. So, um, yeah, totally. okay. Awesome. Thanks, Abby. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook by typing in the Facebook search bar, the Suzanne Venker show. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.